And I think PUBG, fundamentally, when you break it down, is just hide and go seek. Welcome to episode 123 of We The Gamer Cast. It's the official podcast of WeTheNerdy.com, and it comes to you every Monday on iTunes, Google Play, and Mother Loving YouTube. Guys, that was a pretty decent, pretty decent hey, and if you're hearing, I'm going to try and remove this hiss out of the background after, after editing, but that hiss you may be hearing, and if you're watching the video, you can see Lincoln is sleeping. He slept right through that. I've got the little baby cam. That was a risky move, everybody. But I wanted to give you the hay that you deserve on this here Monday or Tuesday or whenever you're tuning into this. Thank you so much whenever it is that you're hearing or watching this. Thank you for being here with me on this ride of We The Gamer Cast. Who knows where this show will take us together, everyone? Uh, gosh. Well, before I get too far into it, if you're new, here's the deal. Every week I have Sweet Hangs with a stranger from the internet. And if you want to be part of the show, just tweet at me. It's Sean Capri, Sean like Connor Capri like the pants. That's it. That's the only, I guess the only other prerequisite is that you have like Skype or other form of electronic communication where we can actually talk. But that's the only thing. Guys, I can't wait to continue to have these conversations well into the new year and beyond. I don't know, I don't know what, what this year has in store. I feel like at the beginning of 20, 2017, I had sort of like an idea of what was going to happen. But I, I have no idea. I'm, I feel like we've sort of expanded beyond the the uh, the boundaries of like the solar system. We're now into interstellar space. Of what on earth am I even talking about, guys? Let's. Uh, I want to get into a quick shout out here uh, before we get into the Patreon producers. Adam Leonard is selling T-shirts. He does the artwork of my my Twitter profile. He does all the artwork for pretty much everybody on this uh, super indie podcast network. And it's amazing. He just did a great T-shirt for his brother John for for Christmas, and I think that I think Bobby was saying that that sparked him to start up his own shop. So the URL for the for the for the shop is I think kind of crazy. So go follow Adam if you're not already. I can't even remember which exact store it is, but you, you'll find it on his Twitter at the art sorry at the art of Adam L. And I will definitely be buying two shirts, one for myself and one for for Chelsea. So. Be sure to go support Adam on that note too, and I will I will wear it on a future show. That's what's gonna happen. I can't wait. So congratulations to Adam for launching that. Finally, man, just get it done. I'm so impressed by your skills and your talent. I can't wait to support you there. And uh, I should do this as well because I really couldn't do this show without the support of all of our amazing people on Patreon.com/slash/MakeUsBetter. This is on video because of you guys. I now have an amazing webcam because like you guys continue to push me forward and I love that. Who knows, like I said, what 2018 has in store and it's because you keep pushing us. And I want to give a quick shout out to all of our Patreon producers, including our Platinum Executive Producer, Corey Hicks, our Gold Executive Producer, Sheldon Benedict, which by the way, man, I don't know if you want to like talk about stuff that's going on with your house, but good luck. I can't even imagine. Uh, please, everybody, go give well wishes to Sheldon Benedict and uh, he's at uh, you can find him actually his podcast too, quest for pixels you remember him he was on the show a couple weeks ago uh, and all of our gentlemen executive producers as well Nick Militia Joel Brooks James Johnson Dr. Doom Jesse Armstrong Mr. Handsome Jesse Armstrong Glocko Schaefer David Ray Mike Drummy Brendan Myers holy crap guys there's so many of you Aaron Doherty Martini Jean and our newest patron comes in at an executive level thank you Kieran Smith man Every, it's just so amazing to see these names pop up and you guys continue, like I said, to push us forward. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You deserve all of this time at the start of every single show. Thank you so much for all of your support, uh, for supporting this show, If We Ran Nintendo, and the gaming gurus and everything that we got, we're doing over here. So, oh, by the way, speaking of If We Ran Nintendo, I will be on If We Ran Nintendo tonight. If you're listening to this on Monday, I'm coming back. Special episode, so be sure to tune in for that. I can't wait to uh, put on the old, the old different and Nintendo pants because I was, I, I'm just wearing pajama pants right now, but that has nothing to do with anything. Before we get into my chat with Drew McMillan, which some of you, if you're here for the first time and you're like, I came for Drew, what is all this rambling? It's kind of the, it's kind of the thing. Uh, I get, I get maybe five or six minutes, maybe ten, maybe, maybe 
well, if I keep rambling, it will be 10. So let's get on with it. This is just the deal. Um, I'm feeling now we're a week into the new year, we're a week into 2018. And I had a lot of good intentions to set good intentions to set resolutions and things like that but i feel like the 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 window is closing do you guys feel that too do you feel like there's a certain amount of time that you can make new year's resolutions and i'm like i know sort of things that i kind of want to do like i know directions that i want to go in but i haven't locked down like specific resolutions and i don't know if that's good or bad maybe maybe just be better is is a good enough resolution obviously i've talked about mental health and we'll get into that with drew as well but i want to i want to be a little bit more on the gaming side like do i want to play more new games why i want to hit my backlog i haven't really quite tackled it what i think i might end up doing here because i i put myself in a bit of a pickle by spending uh, and a, a just a stupid amount of money on all the digital sales i have more games than i even can count i literally have to go into like my email receipts to keep track of which ones that i actually purchased so i'm going to go through those i think i'm going to have to maybe write a blog post on weed the nerdy about this stupid situation and um maybe come up with a bit of a plan because i feel like i'm i'm floundering a little bit right now i don't know exactly which one i want to land on i've got more than enough options maybe i'll maybe i'll, I'll tackle tacoma right after this maybe that's what i'll do but I, there's more than that, guys. There's there's big games, small games, middle games. Guys, uh, why don't we get right into it? Uh, my guest this week is Drew McMillan. Uh, you know him from the Game Moves podcast, and I is I met him in Toronto just just over a couple, well, end of November, I guess. And I, I have been wanting to have him on the show. My last hit is Ryan Turford. You're next, my friend. Uh, we've worked together on multiple different shows, and and we've podcasted together, but never in this environment. So uh, this all comes to pass because of probably the fifth or sixth show with Brock McLaughlin, where just out of nowhere, this guy hits me up and he wants to be on the show. And that that's how I found the Game Moose guys. So this is, this is a cosmic kind of episode. I'm so happy. I think you guys will enjoy it a lot. Here he is, Drew McMillan. How old are you, Sean? I'm 33, and I'm realizing that I'm about, in 2018, I'll turn 34 and officially enter, well, at least in my consideration, I I officially enter my mid-30s. Yeah, I'm 36, I'm turning 37 in in four months. You'd never know know it, though. I said this to you when we were in Toronto, like, you would never know that that you were in your mid-30s already. I thought you were younger than me, actually. But you have such sage wisdom, and I guess that's Mm -hmm. what should have been, that's what should have tipped me off a little bit. Ah. And I'm trying to like wrap my brain around. I was I was giving some thought. I'm like, how what kind of questions I need to I need to get Drew on some sort of like rant or tirade or something that doesn't have anything to do with microtransactions even though because I hate that yeah. that's a that became a thing in 2017. Everybody knows that about me. Uh, but at the same the time, you you provided I think what was probably like the best dissertation of microtransactions and the way that loot boxes work and the whole like mm-hmm. rationale behind why things yeah. are purple and and all of that thing. So yeah. everybody should check out Game Moose podcast. Um, but before we get into any of that, I kind of wanted to dive a little bit more into the origins of of your gaming because I the one of the reasons that I love Game Moose podcast so much is because you and Ryan managed to play everything and it seems like you have all of your life like it doesn't really seem like you have any blind spots i feel like you guys just play you have everything kind of covered and it's really impressive <laughs> to me where well, between between Sorry. the two of us absolutely yeah. uh we i mean we, we have a bunch of overlaps but like i guess the one big thing is is sports games between mm-hmm. the two of us i think ryan only plays like nhl games yep right but i As mean a canadian prerequisite well yeah absolutely yeah but yeah, I mean, it's just kind of like our tastes are pretty diverse. Like Ryan gets a little bit more into JRPGs, I get a little bit more into Western stuff. But mm-hmm. like, but then we come together on a lot of things too. I mean, our favorite game of all time is the same game, it's Super Metroid. Mm-hmm. Like, period. Right? There's no doubt about that. So, um, I, I mean, I started playing games when God, ooh, I was five. I got my Atari Twenty Six Hundred. Yeah, man. Uh, way back in like 1986, mm-hmm. I got it. I got it late. Because, uh, you know, I was like, every, all my friends had an NES, and I was like, Mom, Dad, I want an NES. But that was like, an NES was pricey back in the day. Mm-hmm. So they got a 2600 cheap because, like, Atari was dying. Yep. And, you know, I remember playing games like Dig Dug and Crossbow and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And eventually I uh, 
I, I pleaded with him enough that I got an NES like a couple years after that. <laughs> um, was it like a birthday present or anything big, like special or anything like that? Or it's yeah, like, it's, it's it, birthday. Like it kind of had to be, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because I mean, it's easy for us to forget, but like when you look at like inflation, the the cost of those machines was like it's the same as what it is now, essentially. Right. right? Like it, it's like four or five hundred bucks. I mean, that's a big deal for a family, you mm-hmm. know. Especially, I mean, my my parents weren't wealthy people you know uh they had to make uh, sacrifices and choices here and there so mm-hmm. my, um, my parents quickly realized like the, they, they were they were uh they were very smart about it they realized yeah. that everybody else had it so why would they right. spend money on it like if right. if, yes. if we were we were going to be hanging out with friends all the time anyways and just like ship us off to somebody else's house mm-hmm. why in the world would you ever you know spend the time or money on 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 something like that so yeah, just go go down the street to Craig's place and play his uh, Super Mario Brothers. Pretty pretty much. Yeah. So, so that that I mean that, that was I mean like so since then I've been playing games like crazy. Like it, I remember the, that era where like mm-hmm. every weekend or whatever, every time I get spare time, it was you know, you ride your bike to the local like video store, <laughs> which eventually became Blockbuster Video to find like the thing to rent. And even when you couldn't find the thing you wanted to rent, then you had to rent the other thing. Mm-hmm. Like, I remember renting Final Fantasy VI like eight times and hoping that my save didn't get deleted. And a couple of times it did. And Wait a know. minute. You're saying that sometimes it did not get deleted? Like, you could actually yeah. count on that as being a thing? Yeah. What, I mean, like, I grew up in the suburbs. I grew up in Brampton, mm-hmm. which is, uh, you know, it, it's it's about half a million people now. But at the time, it was like, it was way less. And it was like 300,000, 200,000 people. So it was a small city. Mm-hmm. And then in a small little, like, suburb and, like, a little subsection of that that or that city, uh, subdivision, as we like to call it. And, uh, yeah, like, ride my bike to the local video store. And maybe there'd be, like, you know, you count on maybe, like, 30 or 40 kids all going to that same store. You know, so when you got the game, and it's funny because there's always like on the rental, there was always like the 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 save really early on in the game. Maybe your save, which was midway through the game, and somebody had like everything. Yeah, and like every once in a while, like no one would ever delete yeah. that. It's one. like no a cheat code. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So you can was... actually. That's amazing too. Okay, so I think that this actually speaks to even a, a cooler thing, Drew. And I don't know if you've ever... I, I consider TB to be very intelligent, actually. And that's why I wanted to have you on the show, just to sort of, like, up the smartness on here. We had uh, Chris Johnson on last week. He did the exact same thing. I basically... <laughs> that's the whole thing about the show, is I get to have guests come on, and you guys make it great. I just don't... I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. I just pull greatness from, from people who are on here. Uh, and I think the greatness started with you, like... You, you have, talk to me about like the jump from just going from like Dig Dug, I'm playing Atari to Final Fantasy. Like I, to you, I'm imagining that's not like a jump, but to me, that's just like it's totally huge. There's a chasm in between like the arcade stuff that you're playing on, like arcade yeah. in a home kind of thing, to yeah. multiple systems and super intense Final Fantasy RPG, JRPG stuff. I, I think I think it was. Um, I think I, I was just I was so hooked on just games. Period. Yeah. I had to play everything. Okay. You know? I had to get through that wall, you know, mm-hmm. like, because you, you, you'd burn, like, especially arcade games, you know, like, the reality is they have about two hours worth of content in most of them, right? right? Like, you burn th- through those pretty quick. When you find a game that can really hook you, and back in those days, uh, an RPG would last you 40, 60 hours, mm-hmm. right? I mean, we're used to these days, you're lucky if it lasts you 25, right? right? Like a really, really deep RPG, um, 40 hour games are a thing of the past. So at the time, it was like that was huge. That was the stuff that, that hooked me. I was like, wow, this is something that. And, and to be fair, I don't think I really appreciated the depth of the systems at the time. You I were was just kinda, beating the game. Just banging my head against the wall, you know. <laughs> in, some, in, in the case of Final Fantasy IV, literally banging my head against the wall, the Doom Wall, the enemy. Because uh, I remember getting killed by that multiple times. But then I played it like a few. I played it on the DS like a few years ago, and I was like, "This is really easy once you know what you're doing." Yeah, of course. Well, you, know, you you've, so. it's like like just graduating throughout the years of all the yeah. different systems, and then like that was like developers would have been learning each and every time. So then you are growing with them, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man, that's why again, that's why I like the the Game Moves podcast because you guys kind of take. I that's what I want to do with Lincoln. I think is is introduce yeah. role playing games early because i've mm-hmm. always I, i've yet to meet somebody who really enjoys role-playing games who's a total idiot like this yeah. just doesn't seem to <laughs> be there i don't know man it's just it's more like me who like people who are casually into role-playing games are sort of like it, it it's like a 
I want to do like an, a scientific experiment because I feel like however much experience you have, it's like a direct correlation. And I don't yeah. even think that it, that there's anything else to it. Well, so, it, it does, it does so many different things, right? Like RPGs, they mm-hmm. introduce really high level mathematical concepts to you at a young age. They introduce um, really complex narrative ideas mm. uh, and then like beautiful art and there's all kinds of stuff there. Like, I mean, those games really challenged me as a kid. Well, the so, narrative is an interesting point, too. There's just a lot of reading. Like it was yeah. one of the only styles of games back then where you were actually like you were reading like it was a book. Yeah. So the whole... I, re- I remember my parents. I remember having that conversation with my parents who were like, oh, well, like, you know, like playing video games and they were they wanted to watch what I was playing. They wanted to see what I was doing because mm-hmm. I was spending a lot of time doing They're like, you know, like, oh, but you could be reading a book or learning something. And then my son me playing Final Fantasy and they're like, no, this is really like genuinely there are lots of things that you're learning from this. Mm-hmm. There is a lot there. So, yeah, man. Yeah. And so what about like moving through the through the consoles? Was it always like Nintendo for you or were you kind of like back and forth? Like, how was that journey for you? So I, like, I was again, like, you know, didn't have a lot of money growing up. Mm-hmm. Um I was always really, really resentful of Sega as a company. Of course. And here's here's why. Oh, okay. Uh, they, I mean, you guys remember that probably the, the the advertising campaign that they had where it was like, you know, like blast processing and mm-hmm. like, Sega you know, does what Nintendo. Does what, Nintendo. Mm-hmm. what they were really doing was pitting kids against one another. Like, that was really kind of a, a sketchy thing to do. Yep. I mean, the reality was there were dividing lines in the playground and it wasn't, it wasn't because we had any real sense of brand loyalty. Our parents were buying these things mm-hmm. or we were trying to make the best choice. There was no way in hell that we would, I would live in a world where I would, as a kid, I would have a Sega Genesis and a Super Nintendo. Like that was just not a, a thing, a financial option. Yeah. Right. Um, and so you had like all these kids who like, and then they turned to like teasing and bullying. They're like, aha, my Sega do what Nintendo. And, and it like genuinely, I think, I think it was really shitty that they did that. <laughs> essentially that, as a marketing ploy, they tried to, you know, you know pit kids against one another, uh-huh. and and in the end, let's be real, it didn't work, right? Mm-hmm. Like, who's still around? Well, they had like, they, they had the little Sega. blips, and so they had yeah. they, and that's the in in marketing, it's this weird thing of you get you do a thing and you see a blip and you go, yeah, that worked, so let's yeah. continue to do that. But you actually don't really see is this is this sustainable? And I actually love that you call this out because I a hundred percent agree on. That are in pretty much all of life, not necessarily only in marketing, but like you can you can win those battles, but like it's sort of like you've won the battle, but you will not. The war is far from over. Like the right. classic, you know, every yeah. Ninja Turtles cartoon that we we would have seen. Yeah, um, yeah I, I never really thought of it being really targeted towards kids, but of course it, that's was that was the original yeah. of the of the console wars, oddly enough. Um, and it was it was perpetrated by by Sega. Do you think Nintendo like Nintendo never really like struck back, but PlayStation no. tried to do the same thing when they started up. We had a Crash Bandicoot literally like sitting outside the, the Nintendo of America offices in yeah. uh, in Seattle with his megaphone. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was back in the I, I sort of like uh, uh, the aged attitude into era. The, the attitude era, exactly the <laughs> attitude era of of both wrestling and video games uh, advertising. Right. Um, yeah, the same sort of thing. Like, I mean, it, they kind of perpetuated these sort of like fanboy uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, attitudes. Mm-hmm. And even then, um, so at that point, you know, I was a little bit older. I had my own money. Like, I was working. I was a teenager. I was working. Like, uh, I was digging dirt. I was I was slinging dirt at a, 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 a landscape supply company. So I was mm-hmm. busting my ass. I was making a lot of money because I was working like I was running like twenty hour weekends every weekend. Oh my God. And I was like, this is this is my money now. I could just spend it. So I was like. I had a I had a PlayStation. I had an N sixty four. I had a Sega Saturn. Eventually bought my own Dreamcast. Sega Saturn yeah. too. Holy crap! You were pulling in bank. Well, well I went back and at that, this is at this point I bought an old Saturn. I think at that stage. Um, What's a game? Because I don't even know a thing. I can't. I couldn't even name you a game off of off a of Sega Saturn. What's What's up um, from that library that's notable? Oh God, I I can't even remember. That's uh, like, the thing. What a oh, like, what a shame. I, like, I think you probably ended up collecting. I think I bought it like off of. Probably eBay, yeah. Very early on, from somebody, and I had like a stack of like used games that I never played. Oh, I, I don't feel like there was like a, like a shmup in there and a couple other weird games. Maybe like a Fantasy Star game. Oh, I never played a Fantasy Star game. I would argue that maybe Sega Saturn might be the best name for a system. Oh, I love that they they they, they, they did that whole um, naming convention as part of uh, like their their arcade hardware. Mm-hmm. Right, so there was like there was the the Saturn, the Pluto, the Jupiter, 
right? Yeah. Uh, the Saturn was the home version, and then the Pluto and the Jupiter were like the different arcade things. And when I started learning about that, I thought that was so cool. So the realization that, wait a minute, the actual arcade hardware mm-hmm. is in my house. Right? So maybe, I wonder if there, if somebody can go back to the Pluto and realize that, that it really wasn't an actual system. It was like a dwarf system. Like years I, later, we would discover that it wasn't really a planet. And same thing with the system. It wasn't really a, yeah. a real it thing. Really an, it wasn't really an arcade machine. It yeah. was just the Sega Saturn that they put in a big box. should have called it Neptune. Yeah. I, there is a Neptune as well. There oh, there Neptune. you go. Well, they just ran out of planets. And I can't blame, I can't really blame them for that. Yeah, absolutely. See, and I just love space, man. I, I don't know what it is. There, <laughs> is there like another correlation with like video games? Am I the only one who just has like this total fascination with space? It's like I go I'm, from my video game podcast to Star Talk Radio. I'm a huge, huge space nerd. Yeah, uh, man. I, I don't know. Like, w- so we met uh, in person for the first time a couple yep. of months ago. By the way, I want to. I, I wanted to make sure that I mentioned this while we talk about us meeting, and I don't want to get yeah. too far off track. Yeah. Um, you and I, we met at the CBC as yep. Canadians should, and uh-huh. and I, I'll never forget this, man. It was so special. You just came up and gave me a big old bear hug. Yeah, and man. I just like I just, and that's what I wanted to do. And the fact that you came with like your arms open first, I was just like. This this just feels right. This is this yeah. is exactly like you know you got this big flight over and you're like I mean these people for the first time I've talked to you so many times before yeah and you came with with uh, arms wide open I just wanted to thank you so much for that that honestly meant the world to me and I will it made it an unforgettable trip for sure it's interesting you know like uh, the more people I've met on uh, so like you know when when Ryan and I started the Game Was podcast we didn't know anybody in sort of the, the Canadian gaming community at all mm-hmm. right um, we met a few people through Twitter. Uh, namely you and Brock. Uh, mm-hmm. So Brock is, of course, the third on on the Game Boys podcast, and we. It, it's over the over the years of being part of that. I realized it's, it's kind of like a big, weird, extended family. Yeah, man. You know, um, I like I, like we've like got people here in Toronto, like like uh, like Sean, Mega Sean on Twitter, and uh, you know, like Brock, Brock Star, uh, the girls on Games Cast, and you know, uh, like late, you know. Leah and those guys. There's all these. This, it's with this really tight community, like the guys over at CGM, Brandon, and and uh, you know, and Lisa, and like we start meeting people at the same events too. And then it, it, it's it's so interesting. It's a small business. Mm-hmm. Even even internationally, video games is a small business and video game journalism. And then yeah, to look at it, sort of like even in Canada, it's even smaller. So we've got this cool tight little community. So like meeting you was kind of like meeting like a family member that I hadn't met in person yet. You yeah, know, that's, just, that's how I saw it, you know. So, it, no, it was great. Um, well, what I love, and I'll t- just t- quickly touch on this, too, with, like, the whole, like, the Canadian side of things is, like, there's, there's a, there's, like, an inclination, there's a gravity pull of the United States. So, like, yeah. if you're, oh, yeah. if you're, like, an actor or whatever, if you want to make it big, you go to L.A., you go to New York kind of thing. But, like, yeah. there's sort of, like, this, this cool thing that's happening where you don't actually need to do that. Like, you can actually stay within Canada and still, like, find a family, like you said, and find whatever it is that you're looking for but find a community i guess is really it where you don't have to you know even have to compete with like the just the juggernaut that is the united states you can actually exist within canada and it's totally fine and i don't i guess i was sort of surprised by by that uh difference because i always kind of just thought you have to make it if you're going to make it at all you have to make it in the states and i think that a lot of canadians are sort of grown up like that until you yeah you know i don't know until you find something or maybe you just realize that that that's close to impossible. I, I don't know, it, it, but there's something very real about this Canadian community, and I think we all sort of appreciate and understand that part of it. Is that this is our home, and it's actually like not even that it's just okay. It's a, like this is awesome. Like this yeah. is really great. So that that was that was the genesis of the Game Moose podcast. Um, oh yeah. When when Ryan and I were talking, um, so Ryan and I met at work. Uh, mm-hmm. God, three years ago, or no, we probably met, but four years ago now, four or five years ago, and we'd chat every once in a while, and then I realized, wait, this guy's really into video games, and we'd have these really funny conversations and really sort of like deep conversations with video games. So I realized Ryan ex- understood video games on the same level as I do, yeah, and had the same kind of depth of interest. There are people like, ah, I love to play Street Fighter because Street Fighter are cool, yeah, yeah, and that's totally awesome, yeah. Where me, I was like, I love to play Street Fighter because fighting game mechanics X Y Z. You and were it's really there already. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, like I've been listening to at that point, I had been reading like Game of Sutra regularly. Oh, I yeah. was listening to the Giant Bombcast. Uh, I've been listening to um, uh, GameSpot's podcast for, for years. Mm-hmm. Um, like I just I, I was really interested in, in both like 
gaming mechanics and like the business of it and everything like that. That was always like, that was a hobby up until mm. that point. And I had thought of, of wanting to do that basically ever since Jeff Gersman got fired from GameSpot. Like when I followed his journey for a couple of years, I was like, I really want to do this too. Mm-hmm. I really want to do this too. And and then it was trying to figure out how I was going to do it. And then eventually just taking the leap. When I met Ryan, I was like, we should do this, man. Let's just sit down, record it. And, you know, and let's be Canadian. Let's mm-hmm. be as Canadian as we can. Let's wear it on our sleeves. Because yep. the reality is that there are a bunch of like content generators out there that – they service the American market, but they they forget to mention the things that are important to us. Yep. Things like, is it coming to Canada? What are the release dates? What's the different price point? You know, like there's especially all kinds- now, like we had a point yeah. in time where par- like the prices were pretty much at parity, but parity, now it's yeah. it really changes things. And uh, you know, Mark Mark Carabin from the Warp Whistle podcast, he's sort of like almost rebranded himself uh, through Twitter as the Canardian gamer. And I yep. thought that that was really special, like and really cool to that to that point. And I remember even finding myself almost almost censoring the canadian nature like i would always yeah. automatically translate the price and i probably i still do quite often just so that yeah it just th- sort of the i want to say lowest common denominator but that sounds pejorative but you know what I mean? like just sort of like <laughs> yeah. the, the most common denominator i guess um so yeah it, I, that's the thing I, I noticed first and i remember talking about game news podcast on this show after maybe listening to one or two and i remember i done you guys hadn't really talked about like a focus on being Canadian, it just came through in your show, and I remember commenting on that you guys were unabashedly Canadian. Yeah, and I yeah. like that was, that was that was always the goal, right? It was we, clear we, you we didn't have to name. wave this flag or anything. You yeah. didn't have to do anything. You just you just were, and I don't know. I don't know another show that is quite like that, to be honest with you. Uh, and that's cool. I mean, that's something I, I think we really appreciate that. That was the. That's the niche we want to exist in. Don't get me wrong. We want other people from other places to listen. And we've got listeners from like Germany and Poland and Israel and stuff like that too. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we love that people listen to us and and like to hear what we have to say. Because there's stuff definitely when we talk about things like loot boxes or we talk about like uh, the controversies in a particular RPG or something like that. Mm -hmm. Like – or like the low quality of uh, 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 Mass Effect Andromeda. All those things are universal. I need to go back to your spoiler. I want to give a quick shout out to your spoiler cast on uh, Mass Effect Andromeda. I want to go back because I officially, I tried it, tried my best. I traded it yeah. in and actually will just sort of have my, my EA access in the vault. And that that's yeah. how, if I ever want to go back to it. But I, I will go back to, to that show. And I, I sort of, going back to the Canadian nature of, of the show and, and you talking about your international listeners, it's sort yeah. of akin to me, like I don't know why this didn't really occur to me before, where you, when, when Canadians travel abroad, we put, it's pretty typical to put like a Canadian flag or a badge on your backpack. And yeah. like that's like, I'm not American. <laughs> like, treat me well. Yeah. It's like we, yeah. people have noticed that that you are received in a different way when they know that you're Canadian. Yeah. And of course, like that would translate over into the podcast world or into the internet, like the international internet. That if you're Canadian, yeah. maybe there's something different about that. And, and, and instead of trying to bleed over into into being American or assimilated into that culture and and everything, because we are so similar, it's easy to do that. Instead, yeah. um brand out as as a canadian but you know you guys don't start out with an anthem or anything like that you just you well, throw a moose we, on the logo and that's you know we get the point <laughs> we don't we don't now yeah that's uh, true it's worth noting that for the first six months we had like a little <laughs> snippet at Did the very really? beginning with the canadian uh anthem uh the, that was about as sort of like jingoistic as we got yeah uh, what was that but, word jingoistic 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 uh it's um it, 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 it's awe. an old it's an old term it kind of like it's it's more specifically it's like to american it's not no it's 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 like um like absurd patriotism it's patriotism to like a really high degree i freaking yeah. love this man i'm so yeah. happy you're on this uh, show holy crap like, like, they you talk should about do my like, job you should do this and just talk to people from now on because your ah. vocabulary is much better than mine <laughs> good lord uh yeah so you know, we, we didn't want to be like like we love Canada, but like that's that's always been the difference between Canada and the United States. Is mm-hmm. I I love Canada. I love everything about Canada. And, uh, number one, I don't think that we're better than anyone else, mm-hmm. right? I think there, there's a lot we could do that's better. I think that we we do a lot of great things, and I'm proud of the things we do. I, I love our healthcare system, and I love um, you know I I love the the nature of our politics that is not rude or nasty. Mm-hmm. Um, for the most part, anyway. Uh, we, I get, love, we get our dips, and then it's sort of like, oh, my goodness. How, yeah, how could yeah. you say that? Yeah. So, uh, you know, 
certainly I, I love being Canadian, but I don't go around. There's there's no sense of exceptionalism, right? Mm-hmm. I don't say that Canada is better than like th- that's sort of like that's a trait of jingoism, American jingoism specifically. But jingoism on paper refers specifically to the United States. So the, the notion that America is the greatest nation in the world. Mm-hmm. You know, you mentioned something about our our healthcare system, and I'm gonna I'm yeah. gonna take us uh, on a different, bit of a different track here. Um, <laughs> You know, sometimes I've, I've tried to wrap my mind around how healthcare works in the states and how it, yeah. a lot of people will say, "Well, you just have insurance and you're totally fine," and yeah. and I think like, oh, I guess I guess that's okay, but then I still hear these stories about you know babies being born and then they cost ten thousand dollars or whatever it is, yeah. and I don't mean to like spread total. Like, I'm want to I want to put a caveat out here that I don't know one hundred percent of the story, so I'm not trying to like perpetrate falsehoods here, but there are a couple of examples within. Canadian living that uh, maybe draw some parallels to what is in America their their healthcare system. So those are dental and what I've just come to uh, come in contact with it, which is mental health. So I've now gone to two therapy sessions and pay you pay out of pocket and then you get reimbursed by your by my by my insurance company that I have through work. But like yeah. if I didn't have that, then I'm not getting I'm not going to therapy. I can't. I can't afford it. It's like, it's yeah. like $200 a session. And actually, yeah. I don't I don't know what my limit is. Like, I need to go and find out for my insurance. Like, I think I'm, I'm covered up to a certain point, which I think yeah. this is, maybe somebody will correct me afterwards, but I feel like this is maybe getting into the territory of, of health care, like just primary care in the States, yeah. where if you break your arm, you go like, if I'm covered, I think I'm going to go get a cast. But if I'm not, maybe I'll just like throw some duct tape on it. Like, I don't know right. if that's sort of the the choices that people have to make. But um, I've come into, I've come to realize that with, with mental health here and dental health as well, where a lot of people are incentivized to not go get care because of insurance. Yeah. So I think yeah. that that was kind of strange. Yeah. I mean, how I, I was recently having a conversation with someone about this, uh, uh, you know, like how does insurance work and how it's, how it's meant to work. The whole notion of like, you know, let's say that you, you live in a place that's prone for tornadoes. A tornado, you've got 30 houses. They all live on a, on one street. Mm-hmm. And every once in a while, a tornado will touch down, and one or two of the houses will get destroyed or damaged. Mm-hmm. So all the people that live in the street all pay into one pot. They all say, like, okay, well, instead of, like, if my house gets destroyed, then, you know, I just pay all that money to fix it. Well, I'll just pay together, and then when one of our houses gets destroyed, we'll all pay from that pot. That way, like, we sort of spread out. The, the financial responsibility for everybody because we all have an equal chance of of our house being destroyed mm-hmm. and then they realize oh hey we've got all this money and it's just sitting there we're just waiting for a tornado to happen what if we were to take that money and invest it somewhere mm-hmm. and then we get even more returns then if someone's house gets destroyed then like we can build on that 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 investment that money you know that's just sitting there doing nothing and potentially we can help even more people if there's even and that's that's the basic idea behind insurance but the problem is when you have a company that now administers that, people realize that, wait a minute, one of the other ways for, for that company to make money is mm-hmm. to just not pay people out. Yeah. Right? If you deny claims... Of course. Then 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 you don't have to take money out of the pot and then you're fine, right? Mm-hmm. And that's... I mean, that's why I have a problem with private health insurance in the United States. Uh, whether or not... It, it's it, That's a gross oversimplification of the whole process. Right. But, you know. So, Yeah. Yeah, uh, it, it's uh, yeah, it, it's it's interesting. Certainly, uh, this is one of the reasons why I love uh, 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 Canada. You know, we get to have these kind of conversations, right? You know, and compare mm-hmm. what the U.S. is like. It's 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 interesting. Well, yeah. and I, I guess I was sort of just like I was sort of looking at it just from even the the mental health aspect of so yeah. many people. Like we talk about, go get help, go talk to somebody, go yep. do something, and then it's like. There is this massive barrier. Yeah. Like, that's sort of what I, I continue to find. And there there are a lot of free resources, but they, they're on the more the self-help side. And I, I yeah. truly believe that there's a really – I talked to Zach Erickson about this when he was on because he yeah. recently graduated from his program. He's now working as a, as a psychologist. And, you know, I, I talked about, like, that very fine line of, man, if, if you misdiagnose or if you mistreat or if you miss something – that the the results are going to be could be catastrophic and so and that's for a trained professional so if 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 we're you know forcing people to 
to go find help on their own or if they're they have to go just i don't know look for free resources i just don't know that that's always going to be the best and you know yeah. they, I, I feel like this is just that that mental health minute that probably will become maybe a little bit more of we the gamer cast as as we go along 2018 it's gonna be a new yeah. year uh, we, we, we we talked about this brief briefly on twitter we, mm-hmm. we had a, a little exchange where you know, like I, I'm a firm, I, I, I strongly believe uh, in, you know, and in, in mental health and, and people being able to take care of themselves. I think that worldwide people are underserved in terms of mental health. We're at a point where there, there it feels like there's a mental health crisis in the world. Yeah. Man. Uh, uh, there's a lot going on. I mean, they talk about, you know, here, but like, like uh, things like, like uh, um, sort of like dating app culture and like social media mm. sort of like grinding people's sort of like sense of uh, uh, self-esteem down and you know th- there's all kinds of stuff that's going on in the world and people can't get the help that they need and that's that's really frustrating and I've always thought of myself as an advocate and one of the things that I think is really important is to talk openly about it yeah right uh, for a long time it was it was a dirty secret if you if you felt like you had some kind of problem you didn't tell anybody you didn't let anybody know. You just quietly took care of it, and that was it. If mm-hmm. if you even did anything about it, I mean, like when we talk about like my parents' era, a lot of times there was a stigma associated with seeing a therapist or mm-hmm. a, a mental health professional of some kind. These days, I like I wear it on my sleeve. I suffer from gen- general anxiety disorder. I suffer from depression. Uh, I have a, a, a an eating disorder as well. You know, like I I'm not afraid to talk about that mm-hmm. stuff. I think if anything, talking about it, you know, it makes me stronger. Definitely. It strengthens me. And I think it helps other people to know that, yeah, if you need help, there's no shame in going out there and getting help. I'm fortunate in that um, the, the the benefits that I have through my day job are amazing. Yeah, uh, I have some of the some of the best mental health benefits a person could get. Oh, wow. I also work a day job that that is very very tough on my mental health. I've yeah, seen, it's I like I work in I work in, in news. I've seen people, you know dead and dismembered on video on like on multiple occasions mm-hmm. it's pretty tough to endure wow. um and then on top of that i've got you know just just the, the baggage i bring with me right um so you know when, when you mentioned you said you know like hey like i i'm having some problems with depression and i'm experiencing this i wanted the first thing i wanted to say was like no you're not alone i think yeah. that's really important to say that hey we all do we all have problems i know that ryan and i talk about this quite a bit in terms of like finding motivation to do stuff for the site and because i mean the reality is confronting what you want to do that like that's your dream that's really hard Mm -hmm. right um following that dream it's really taxing emotionally because what if you fail yeah right that's always something especially i know someone who has um who who has problems with self-esteem and stuff like that that's that's something that i'm constantly facing yeah is what what happens if uh, I I try my goddamn best and people say it's not good enough, mm-hmm. you know, and then at a certain point you just kind of have to try to the hump I get over is try to put that away and just try my best. Mm-hmm. So that's you know like we have committed to doing the cast and doing things like I was really nervous about putting myself on video. Yeah, you know that that was really tough. Yeah, that was a hard jump to make, especially at the time. When but we your hair is so good, Drew. <laughs> it's well, so I, good. At, at the time Ryan and I started doing video, I weighed about eighty pounds heavier than I do now. Yeah, you look awesome, uh, man. You did, thank you. Like, and I have been watching the the journey you've been on too, and it, yeah. it has been extremely impressive and very motivating. And yeah. now, like January is a really good time to be kind of like talking about this and like self improvement and all of these things. But yeah. yeah, man, like you you've done a phenomenal job. Just you'd made a couple changes. I think you talked briefly on the show about, and yeah, yeah eighty pounds later, man, that's crazy. Yeah, I'm st- I'm still going. Uh, you know, like it's it's not always easy. The holidays are so hard. Oh my god, I know. God. It people gets throw me to the point. All the time. Like I'm almost to the point where I'm gonna get mad at people. Like yeah. just stop it with the damn baking. You yeah. like to bake? That's great. Well, you make these pretty little things. Throw forty five to ninety percent of it out. Just <laughs> get rid of it. If what you, you enjoy know. was the actual like the act of baking, I get it. But don't yeah. anyway. That's, that's I, I got a little outrageous I, I, there. I had a conversation with a coworker the other day about that. It was like she brought some kind of like candy or treat like every day leading up to the holidays. Oh my and then I came back after the New Year's and she had these giant Tupperware things full of cupcakes. And yeah. I was like, she's like, have one. Come on, have one. I'm like, no, I can't. Like, I'm done. Mm-hmm. It was the holidays and that was it. Like, it was hard to avoid now, but like, not anymore. I'm back on track. Thank you. 
But, you know, and, and it's funny because I read an article a few years ago and it was like bringing like sugary, like high caloric treats into the office is an act of passive, <laughs> passive aggression. <laughs> it is. So, it is passive aggression. Like trying to like that. watching people like watching their willpower break down in front of your eyes. You sick, sadistic bastards. Yeah. Yeah. I, congratulations. The, but the, the big thing that I learned uh, so uh, about about six years ago, I lost 100 pounds. Yeah. And then I slowly, oh, over about man. three years, I put it back on again. Mm-hmm. The thing that I learned uh, through doing that, and and through, and then after that, I started seeing a therapist when I when I gained all the weight back, um, and working with her. Uh, uh, and she specifically, she's a weight loss therapist. She like deals with people who have like emotional eating problems. Mm-hmm. And the the thing that she reminded me of the, the best advice that I got was, if you have a moment of quote unquote, it's not, not even to call it a moment of weakness. If you eat something that isn't in line with what your your diet is, what mm-hmm. what your, the the best choices you're making are, it's not the end of the world. Yeah, because oftentimes people think that oh like, you know they go and they're like oh I had a piece of cake, that's it, my diet's out the window, and yeah. then they just go bonkers and they just mm-hmm. like they backslide to the old habits, uh, they go back to binging and they go back to you know uh, uh, eating things that are unhealthy for them and they don't yeah. hurt them. Uh, so that's that's. If I could give one uh, sort of bit of diet advice out there, is that if you're doing a diet, and and you have you have a moment where you eat something that's not in the diet, that's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, tomorrow will be yeah. better. Yeah, or I mean, you know, like it doesn't mean that you have to completely break. It, it's not a it's it's not a binary thing. It's not a yes or no thing. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, yeah, I mean. I'm really liking it, man. I like it. I've created, you know, I've got goals after every session so far, and I, I'm going to be going for the first little bit every two weeks, and and will hopefully sort of work towards more of like a monthly type of thing. So I've got, you know, I, I talked for an hour, and Lord knows I can fill an hour so easily. Like oh, it, God, it, it's yeah. it's shocking to me how similar it is to this, where we're just like yeah. you just sit and have a conversation, and it's great. And I go back to my car, and I've got a little notepad. I've jot down my notes from like how it went and how I felt about it and the things I need to work on for the next couple of weeks. And the one thing that it has stood out to me in these in these first two sessions is establishing sort of like a frame of reference. So it's all for me it's all about expectations. And I think that like a lot in a lot of things uh, in life in terms of being satisfied or dissatisfied are um what was your what was your expectation out of it? That has to do with games too where we think something is going to blow us away and then we're disappointed and we're really really sad, but we have to remember like what was our frame of reference for yep. that expectation that we set for ourselves. And a yep. lot of the the darkness that I, I have been having is a lot about like expectations of myself and how to perform as a husband, as a dad, as an employee, as like all the different roles that I play. There are expectations. Yeah. And I think that what ended up happening in December is that all of those roles for me, I felt like I was failing at all of them. And I didn't have like a solution and I didn't have like a path to find my way out of that. And so yeah recognizing that is like, I think for the first step for me. And the second step is, um, my therapist is sort of like my, my homework for the next time is, is try to think of my frames of references for parenting, like who or yeah. what, like, is it movies or, or my own life or, or people that I've seen? What are my expectations of dads? And yeah. it was a, such a hard, like, she's like, who is it? And I'm like, I actually don't even know. Like yeah. my whole, like, whether it's a disappointment or just like some some dissonance between my expectation and what I was actually doing was based on nothing. Like so, of course I was off because I don't yeah. have like, really a hard line, and that made me feel like instantly better. Like instant, and now I like I'm st- I'm still searching for what that like it has to be somewhere. Yeah. So whether yeah. it's my own parents or somebody else, like other friends, and I think what's end up going to end up happening is that I'm going to find out that I'm actually doing okay. Like that I, yeah. I do bath time with Lincoln that I, that I do story time that I wake yeah. up, like I'm the one who gets him in the morning and I change his diaper and I throw him at Chelsea and like I do stuff. Yeah. I just always feel like I should probably be doing more. And that was kind of a lot of where that came from. You know, I, I'm, I'm not a parent and that is something that certainly that I think about a lot, you know, like growing up, my dad was away a lot. Uh, my dad was a traffic salesman. He was gone, you know, like a lot of times, like Monday to Friday, he was gone. That mm-hmm. was it. You know, like I got to see my dad on the weekends and, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of times when I think about being a dad, one of the things I think about is I don't want to be like that. Right. You know, I don't want to be the – because my, my dad's thinking was always I'm making the sacrifice so I can provide for the family. Right. Right. And like I would have rather have been poor and had my dad than us have more money and not have my dad around as mm-hmm. much. You know. And that's a similar thing of like 
my dad was around. He worked a lot, but like, yeah. and I know that that's a thing that that dads yeah. or, or men in general will look at. Like, I'm I'm providing, I'm working so that I can do this, and like that is a value. And I, yeah. I think part of another part that I've sort of identified is that I completely devalued that because I think yeah. that that is so common. And I think that's almost like an excuse for yeah, like underperforming in other areas that I've completely devalued that portion of like bringing home the paycheck sort of thing like and chelsea yeah. does an incredible job with her business so i've immediately kind of just went i devalued it completely where yeah. i'm being reminded that you probably shouldn't do that like that's a huge portion of the week and it's a huge portion of like my life that i've had education that leads me up to this point to be able to do that so to devalue it completely is also not really healthy so yeah. but yeah. it's somewhere yeah. in between it's like it's i've yeah. went from like that's worth nothing to other maybe other men going that's worth everything and it totally eliminates my need to do anything else yeah i think that that's sort of where i've landed on that yeah yeah but i don't want i don't want to go on this forever <laughs> i like no. i think we, we probably could because i did want to have you on the show to i, I was like man i want to i want to find something you mentioned as we were as we were having a thank you again for uh, reaching out on Twitter and we ended up kind yeah. of going into maybe what what's happening for 2018 and I know yeah. I don't want to out you a little bit but I, I do want to I yeah. do want to get you on this notion of like kind of like a video essay or dissertation or just having you kind of yeah. like dive into some of these deep dive topics I don't know if this is yeah. something that we can expect on the podcast or on the website or like have you given this some thought and to yeah so I mean this is something you know, we talked. We talked about this. We got a lot of response, uh, specifically. I mean, uh, about the uh, the loot box thing. Yeah. Um, and two things happened there. Number one, I realized I was sort of more allowed to for that to happen because it was on a rare occasion where we couldn't have Brock in the studio. Like Brock was, uh, he was otherwise engaged doing other stuff, so he he just wasn't available that day. So it was just Ryan and I. Mm -hmm. And when it when it's Ryan and I, we tend to be a little less silly and a little bit more serious. Mm -hmm. And not that there's anything wrong with that, because I think one of the things that I love about the podcast is when if it's all three of us, we kind of ride that line. Yep. We jump around between different things, but I don't get to get as laser, laser focused on something for as long because we'll, you feel we'll like move you need to, to move on. Yeah. yeah we, and give other people their time, which is, you know, totally fair. So, yeah, one of the things I'd like to do is do some more sort of like in depth sort of like video essays about some of these, what I see are very serious problems or interesting uh, uh, things that are happening in the video game world. Things that people are treating as surface level, but you see yeah. like more than just the tip of the iceberg kind of thing. Yeah, I, I mean, what comes to mind, the person that comes to mind, sort of the, the, the inspiration for that more than anyone else is Danny O'Dwyer. Yeah, man. Um, never followed any of Danny's stuff. Uh, back when he was doing stuff for GameSpot, yep. he was doing incredible, incredible work. Um, uh, the, the sort of the... The, 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 the spark of the idea of like how I wanted to approach the loot box thing was sort of inspired by one of his uh, uh, videos he did for GameSpot, which was the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the Hardcore Gamers uh, slot machine, mm. um, where he talked about the ideas of using tactics from uh, psychological tactics from, from, like, from gambling and, and casinos and applying those to video games. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I sort of, and I was like, yeah, well, of course they did that. And then I already had some knowledge about that. I'm a person who, I am an unrepentant anti-capitalist. Oh. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, pretty pretty heavily. Uh, if you watch my, so I, have, I do have a, a video series that I started a few months ago called RoboFlix. And the first episode I did was about. RoboFlix? RoboFlix. RoboFlix. Oh, Flix, it's, Flix. And, and most of the movies that I want to talk about involve robots. I love robots. So the first one I did, <laughs> the first one I did was uh, was RoboCop. Of and course. of course, RoboCop has some very heavy anti-capitalist uh, sentiment in it. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, I mean, I am always keeping an eye out for what I feel are sort of like these sort of like predatory corporate, uh, 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 you know, marketing and manipulation campaigns. Yeah, man, it's it goes back to the Sega thing too. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's probably one of the where, places where, like, emotionally, where where that stems from mm -hmm. is, you know, because the the reality is that these companies have billions of dollars um, and almost infinite resources to try to influence and manipulate you. Mm -hmm. um, I guess another place I get sort of like these things where there's, there's a great sh uh, uh, podcast on the the CBC called Under the Influence, which is fantastic, which talks about.
Let's try Ooh. this again. Sorry about that, man. I don't know. Uh, Excuse me. Oh, it looks like the it. audio settings are not set correctly. Hold on. Skype crashed on me, if you can hear me. Sweet. Yeah, no, I can. You, you look even clearer, actually. So you're, you're good. All right. There we go. Yeah, I, uh, I just had to change it back to. No. Don't ask me again. It was like, hey, you're using two different devices. You're using your Oh, headphones. Yeti. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, it, it just yeah, went, no, no worries, froze. man. Yeah. It's funny because I was just actually sliding you over my display, as, uh, <laughs> and I thought I did something because it, it, as soon uh, as I moved you over, it, it crashed. So, uh, yeah. but that was just an OBS, so it was a little different. Okay, so I'll pick up from um, under the influence. I'll start from there. Sure. Okay. Uh, I'm going to get my hands off the desk. I, the, the mount for the Yeti is so transfers. Yeah, like they, they need to put a shock mount on this fucking thing. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, so yeah, there's a, there's a great uh, uh, podcast called Under the Influence that, that talks about that sort of stuff too uh, on the CBC where they talk about how companies use, you know, billions of dollars to essentially manipulate you into doing stuff that, that, that goes against your best interest in a lot of times. And I think because the video game industry is so heavily focused on young people. Um, I want to be an advocate for, mm -hmm. for those people. So I certainly, I like to talk about that sort of stuff a lot. Also like sort of like the high level sort of like how like gameplay mechanics, uh, like things like, like, like emergent properties. Mm. Um, so the, the notion that you have these small uh, uh, sort of discrete systems and how they interact together to produce something that, that is, um, that is greater than the sum of its parts, or totally. it appears to be. Mm -hmm. I think a great example of that is uh, Breath of the Wild. Yep. Right. Breath of the Wild is basically a, like it's an ecosystem. It's a series of small uh, uh, mechanics that all interact together um, to produce what is like a, a really great fun gameplay mm -hmm. experience. Well, that seems to me that like that existed previously in the 2d sort of like linear sort of uh like they yeah. talked about actually so they went from 2d and you have like you have that that hit of dopamine every so often where you have like a little bit of success you have a yeah. you've conquered like a jump or you got this got rid of this enemy or something yeah. so they mastered that in the 2d space and they mastered it a little bit in the in the first person shooter space with with halo and they talk about the 30 second loop that you're always having something new and a refresh every 30 seconds a new encounter yeah. And now we're into the open world space where yeah. maybe that has hasn't really hit, or maybe we have. And now this now now Breath of the Wild is like a new, a new style of that. I think Assassin's Creed maybe introduced the whole. Oh, I'll just go do that, or oh, there's yeah. that over there, and I'll just like like that emergent sort of gameplay of um, yeah. new, not necessarily like side quests, but somebody screaming yeah. out for help. Um, Red Dead Redemption was a great example of that, in my yeah. opinion. Absolutely. I mean, um, I think. Uh, uh, People have tried it for a while. Mm -hmm. The reality is that when you get you get to a place where, you know, one of, one of the things I'll definitely talk about is the transition from from two D or sprite based games um, uh, uh, to polygonal or you know, as at the time yeah. we called it three D, but three D of course is a different connotation these days. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very clear about that. The transition to poly polygonal games is the reality was that not only did it open up all of these uh, uh, possibilities for like how you could visually uh, uh, experience a game, but you now had a whole new level, a uh, new plane uh, uh, to play with in terms of like, not only you couldn't just go left, right, up and down, you could go left, right, up and down, forward and back. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the, the amount of complexity that that added to gameplay systems was exponential. Mm -hmm. It was so much, things were got so much more complex and from there, it's only sort of like, uh, 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 it's only sort of snowballed. When, when you think about the sort of things that have built on top of that, so things like um, like physics systems, right, mm -hmm. which now can exist in, in 2D worlds as well. That, that was, I think adding physics was probably one of the most groundbreaking and important things in video game history mm -hmm. in the last years. I think it's, it's really, really um, hugely underestimated how important it is. I think it's one of the reasons why they leaned on it so heavily in, in Half-Life 2. Yep. Um, you have the gravity the, gun. Yeah, yeah, and and it became it became huge. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah, leading uh, into portal, and just yeah. the momentum of yourself like that, that that yeah. um, progressive momentum going from yeah. one to the yeah, totally. So then, when you combine those things with persistence, um, the, the persistence, and you know, there been there persistence has been available in other games in the past. There've mm -hmm. been. Two D games that have been somewhat open world, but they they kind of fake it a little bit. Right. The the way we do persistence now is a lot more. 
it's not it's a lot truer right mm-hmm. and, and i mean and then i on top of that you add like um other players interacting so i think like games like uh like Rust or Ark or I, I can see why people are so fascinated by these games, even though they're not necessarily for me. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the the layers of these all these simple systems and how they interact together is, is just absolutely fascinating. Um, I, I think it's a thing that like Bioshock had promised was going to give us way, way, way back Ooh, in the day. Oh yeah, man. Right? And then they never really did it. And the the whole idea was for those of you who don't know, if you followed the development of Bioshock years ago, you know that that's what they talked about. They wanted the idea to be that, like, uh, Rapture was this world that had sort of devolved into this, its own sort of breathing, thinking ecosystem. Mm-hmm. And things like, like all of the, the different AIs would play off of one another, right? The little sisters, their job was to get the atom. The big daddies, their job was to protect the little sisters. The splicers, there would be different breeds of splicers that were trying to kill one another and, and have different motivations, right? And and so the idea would be that not necessarily everybody was trying to kill you. You were just kind of like a fly in the wall, and your goal was to get to from A to B. Mm-hmm. And, and how were so you often going to your cause would pass, or your mo- like what your goal or objective was, was like you're going right. to do the same thing. Or yeah, even to, precisely. Even to achieve your goal, you need what they need as well. Yeah, so it, it may be that, like, you know, you're in a place where like the splicers like want your ammunition mm-hmm. or they want everybody always wants your atom so everyone's going after you for don't that don't you right? think it's interesting that they never really go went into the uh like why wasn't i ever addicted like why didn't i ever become a junkie kind of thing as yeah. as the player like that's a whole other thing that that yeah. they could go back bioshock is such a rich i mean yeah. it sounds like sort of cliche to say at this point but it's such a rich world to, yeah, I, yeah. I, but it was locked in on the style of gameplay a little bit. It was it was locked in on still it was still a shooter, still a first person shooter. Yeah. But like, and it very much became just about like, oh, a bad guy shows up, you shoot them, you kill them. Yeah, man. Right? But we've learned a lot since it's been a yeah. twelve years, eleven years yeah. since since Bioshock and games have. You mentioned Ark is, is something I I would like to see. I don't know if anybody has a recommendation for somebody who like breaks down Ark in a way that like. Yeah. You know, like it's sort of like when you when you watch like a documentary on a on a on an album. Like when I watch like the Foo Fighters behind the scenes, it, it makes me appreciate the album more. Like it's like I I've gone from like liking albums from them to like or not liking to totally loving and adoring every song on them. It's because I know a little bit more of like what what does that line mean or like why would they like why would they have this guy doing the backup vocals or how did that come yeah. to, come to pass and yeah. like things like that and and I I need that I think with Ark um, just because I see this as as a as a movement in games i think people are going to iterate upon the minecraft and the just this world the sandbox thing in a, in a truer sense than what we used to call a sandbox in which we would refer to i think grand theft auto kind of thing yeah i mean look at like what what is the biggest open world game right now it's uh, player unknown battlegrounds right mm-hmm. like that game is i mean it's essentially an open world shooter mm-hmm. and people were asking me like drew what's the appeal of that game and i said the reality is it's a lot simpler than you realize in terms of what sort of instinct it's keying into. And the reality is that a lot of these games fundamentally borrow ideas from childhood games in, mm-hmm. in fundamental ways and just add new layers of depth or narrative to them in, in interesting ways. Um, you know, uh, and I think PUBG, fundamentally, when you break it down, is just hide-and-go-seek, right? <laughs> Let's yeah. be real. I mean, a fun- functionally, it is. It's like, could you... like? You know, it's in the same way that, you know, you play hide and go seek and then you, you discover a paintball gun and you're like, well, whoa, wait a minute. What if we played hide and go seek except instead of tagging people, you hit people with paintball guns. I'm like, that's Dude, cool. That's I have always it. talked about how PUBG is like is like uh, paintballing, like especially yeah. because you're in this wide open space and you're yeah. like far away from civilization. Like this is yeah. just this is not like your your nerf fight that's in your backyard. You hear little skirmishes off in the distance, yeah. like you can hear yeah. like that pop, 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 and you're like, oh, yeah. somebody's in trouble. Yeah, or I just can like, down. yeah, I can go join in on that, or I can just run in yeah. the other direction. Hide, go seek, man. That's so innocent and primitive, really. It's so yeah. early in our development that that's a thing. Absolutely, that's why that yeah. it taps into our, our brains that way. Yeah, and it's that kind of stuff I find fascinating. So when we talk about what kind of deep dives do I want to do? These are the sorts of things I want to talk I about. Love you know? it, man. I, I also have a like, like you sort of hinted at it a little bit, a, perfor- a perverse interest in the forgotten or like sort of like the secret history of games or like games that we never quite got. Mm-hmm. I love the notion of like, um, 
Oh, this, 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 this I, I'm, I'm going to, I need to find this interview. This is going to blow your mind. Dota, mm-hmm. right? As we know it, Dota essentially existed in, as Warcraft 3 before Warcraft 3 came out in alpha. Right? I'm, not, like, I'm not surprised about that at all. I remember yeah. specifically playing Warcraft 3 and, and this hero thing that they did then. Not, yeah. I didn't love it. Because I was so like maybe a bit more of a purist with Warcraft Two and with Starcraft, and I saw them go off in this other direction. Yeah, but yeah, huge, so, huge, yeah. So, so I remember reading an interview with Ron Pardo, mm-hmm. um, who at the time was the lead developer on Warcraft Three, mm-hmm. and talking about the changes that they were doing. And the, one of the they were prototyping the game in the Starcraft engine, and one of the things they did was they toyed with the idea of creating these hero units, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so they created, uh, 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 you know, like super strong units mm-hmm. and then the other thing they, they told because you have was, that in starcraft as well yeah like you'd have jim rayner or kerrigan they, and they would have particular yeah. abilities but they took it to the next level with warcraft 3 yeah and the other thing they talked about was taking away the notion of base building right right so it, it was it was kind of interesting that um the 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 the, the the, the, the space that it existed in very early on was essentially you had these hero units. You didn't build bases. Your buildings were already built for you, and you mm-hmm. didn't build units. The units were automatically generated by your buildings periodically. Mm-hmm. And, and like, I hated those types of missions in previous real-time strategy games. I hated yeah. where you're just like, pick your path and go get to the, to yeah. the end objective. I, I didn't like that, so that's why I didn't really connect with Warcraft 3 when it came out. But when I thought about it, though, when I sort of like applied the, like, well... Dota 2 and Dota, that's exactly what they are. Yep. You don't build the buildings, right? Right. You just have your heroes, and your units are automatically generated for you, mm-hmm. right? I mean, that's all that is. I thought that was fascinating. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I, 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 the, the notion that, like, games either that got canceled or existed in completely different iterations before they came out, that's probably something I'm going to talk a lot about as well. To me, when so. you mention games that were canceled, I feel like the the obvious or maybe one of the most original was either starcraft ghost or yeah. warcraft i think it was warcraft adventures they had like a yeah. uh was it called that it was an it was a point and click adventure game that they had it was following an orc um or maybe even a troll even i'm, I'm trying to remember it was it was, it was like, warcraft adventures you're yeah, totally right drawn yeah and, and it was thrall it was supposed thrall, to be uh, yes the journey of thrall how thrall became the the leader of the uh the the orcs who I, when you start it was meant to bridge Warcraft 2 and Warcraft 3, right? By the time you hit Warcraft uh, uh, 3, yeah. uh, um, Thrall was meant to be the leader of the orcs, right? So uh, uh, that that was the, the it was supposed to tell the story of him mm-hmm. and and how the the, the the orcs got to where they are at the beginning of Warcraft 3. How they're they're not really the bad guys anymore, mm-hmm. right? Or the traditional bad guys anymore. They're sort of like trying to rediscover themselves and get back to their like their traditional roots and get away from the demonic influence and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of really oh, fascinating things that are like that, yeah. Well, that's the thing yeah. about, like, and, and for anybody who's been a fan of Warcraft from way back in the day, and, and yeah. compared to people who have just coming into contact with Blizzard, yeah. for many of us, we've known the pol- the Blizzard polish for a long, long time, and we've known, yeah. like, the care that they've had, and, and if something isn't working out, those are two great examples of, you just trash it, and it, and it yeah. upset people deeply, yeah. but they are obviously in a much more profitable situation, more prolific situation yeah. now because of that care. I mean, uh, the, one of the, the, the big ones is um, Diablo 2. Mm. Diablo 2, no, no, sorry, excuse me, Diablo 3, not Diablo 2. Diablo 3, uh, uh, they had a whole game in the can, ready to go, and they flushed it down the toilet. I did not know that. That's crazy. Yeah. The version of Diablo 3 that we had was completely different than what we when we got uh, or what we got rather was was different than sort of that mid. That's why it took so long between two and three. Right. Because they developed a whole game and said, "Nope, this isn't working," and got rid of the whole thing. That is one of um, my biggest regrets of not getting into back in, like that because I was more of a PC gamer back in the day, yeah. and and Diablo was always popping up in my PC gamer magazines, and I just didn't. I don't know what it was. I I just didn't dive into it, and yeah. I, that is a that's a huge regret. My first Diablo game is Diablo three. Actually, yeah. like I may have so, tapped into Diablo 2 at somebody else's house or something, but like 3 was the one I played start to finish. So this is something that I'm definitely, I've been working on for a while, um, is I want to, and this ties directly into it, is I really want to do something about Destiny. Yep. And the different forms and iterations and changes that Destiny's experienced from when they first created it 
to essentially what we have now. Um, I'm, I'm planning to time this with the release of Gods of Mars, which is the next expansion. Mm-hmm. Um, Great name. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Is I've, that going to be a thing? Like that? So the first one, what was the first? Oh, um, Osiris. Curse of, Osiris. Curse, Curse of Osiris. Curse of Osiris. Right, but it was based Gods on of... Mercury. I was thinking that maybe right. the, the titles were, were going to be just sort of a journey throughout the solar system. Yeah, sadly, no. Yeah. Uh, uh, and then it just came out very recently that Diablo 2, uh, or, or rather Destiny 2, was rebooted halfway through its development, and mm-hmm. Luke Smith took over. Um, so in May of 2016 is when they started doing some heavy changes to Destiny 2. Mm-hmm. Um, and then reading Jason Schreier's work that he had previously done about Destiny on Destiny 1, one of the things he talked about was, at a certain point, Activision brought over the Diablo team to talk to the Destiny guys oh, yeah. to help them retool as they transitioned after they that, that first change where they basically they, they took everything that they had and they started again mm-hmm. uh, with Destiny when they, when they got rid of um, Jonathan, uh, uh, Jonathan Staten, I think his name is there, their lead writer. There are a bunch of changes that happened there. Um, you know, like I really want to know what was the original Destiny. And as a matter of fact, if you look at some of the old old concept art going way back, Destiny wasn't originally even a science fiction game. Hmm. Destiny was originally supposed to be a fantasy game. Oh, I see. What you mean. Yeah, totally. Sort of yeah. like the difference between Star Trek and Star Wars kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, like, well, initially when they first started doing it, it was set, you know, like. You had swords and spears and you were knights and stuff like that, right? Um, it was not – and then they realized, wait a minute, like one of the things that we do really well is shooting. shooting. We should, uh, so they wanted to sort of transpose those. Like oh, there's so much that I really want to just sort of like just, – just write this history out and mm-hmm. try to determine, you know – Even chapter zero is interesting there. Yeah. Even just like – yeah, separating yeah. from Microsoft and not wanting to do, yeah. or I don't know if it's not wanting, but just not moving away from from, from Halo. Halo. Yeah. And what a man, what a pivotal move for the entire industry because yeah. obviously we're still getting Halo games, but they were yeah. clearly done. And Microsoft, I don't think ever could have seen them doing anything else but Halo. So yeah. that was, I mean, the writing was on the wall, I guess, in a sense. Yeah. But it's too bad that I don't know. Maybe this is a p- quick pivot before we close things out, but like. Yeah. I would love to know your thoughts on even just the way that Microsoft kind of treats their their first party, where they they organize them, they structure, and they've got yeah. these these factories that just pump out. That you've got your your forts. Everybody talks about. You got your Halo yeah. factory. You've got your Gears factory. And even I remember when the Coalition was uh, was renamed. I just I was so they announced it as a, as this uh, exciting thing, and I was just so disappointed. Yeah. That yeah. What, what it was Black Tusk Studios. Black Tusk is awesome. Yes, and Ooh. and and it opened them up to all sorts of different projects that they could do, and yeah. that's the Sony model, and obviously that's working out for them. I yeah. just wonder about like how long is it going to take for for Microsoft to not necessarily completely transfer over to that because I don't know which one is better. Like obviously uh, Sony is seeing a lot of success, but there there has to yeah. be maybe a business decision for having these factories. Maybe there's a, an yeah. efficiency that's found. Uh, possibly, I mean, we know what the end result is. The reality is, the the best uh, Halo game we got was Reach, mm-hmm. right? I mean, that was the last one from Bungie, and it was easily better in terms of like gameplay and narrative execution, and you know, uh, both multiplayer, single player. Like Reach is easily one of the greatest greatest Halo games ever made. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, and then since then, it's been nothing but disappointment. Oh man, I, I, you know, I know you. I knew you were gonna say that, and it hurts me because I, 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 I love three four three, and I love the three four three games, but I'm the only one. <laughs> I, I, I totally understand. I mean, it, it's kind of like making a new Star Wars. I mean, it's it's an impossible standard to yep. live up to. Yep, totally. You know, it's um, a great and, comparison, actually. Yeah, they, they they and they had to do so much. They had so many masters that they had to uh, to serve mm-hmm. there, which is. It's tough. They're in an, impo- in an impossible situation. Yeah. I totally understand. Um, but Bungie leaving is is a product of of Microsoft structure. Of you, if yeah. you are Bungie, you are Halo, and that was yeah, that was it. But million. but man, could you imagine if Destiny was was an Xbox exclusive? Like, because that's what they moved on towards. But I guess it wouldn't exist in the way that it does. Like, this is where things start to get really layered because you mentioned a lot of what we know of Destiny is it comes from Diablo. So that's from the Activision yeah. connection. So it's, yeah. I don't know, man. It's what, a, this is why I love it. The other games. thing too is it's risks, right? Like, um, I think that, you know, a game you hate that we loved over again, the game was podcast. Right? I should say hate, but, uh, uh, as guerrilla games going off and doing horizon, yeah. that was a huge risk. Yep. 
the fact that Sony gives their studios some leeway to take, I mean, if they're not going completely nuts, but they're taking some risks. I mean, Last of Us was a huge risk. Mm-hmm. You know? Because Uncharted was, works. Like, why yeah, like, wh- Why go away why, from why that? Why mess with that? Yeah, why, why is it like, we're going to take all this sort of like the humor and lightheartedness and fun and adventure out of that mm-hmm. and put it into a really bleak zombie game with the same kind of gameplay. People are like, no, you're, 